Welcome to the course on Foundations of Finance. So in this first week, rather than getting into details of what is finance and what is the scope of finance and all these things which are very important, what we are going to do is we are going to be taking a tour of different topics that we actually study under uh, the scope of finance, right? So the objective would not be to kind of like explain everything that we see. In fact, that's what the whole of the course is about. But what we are going to do is just to kind of like see what are the kind of like the different type of questions and settings where what we are kind of uh, learning can be applied, to, right? So one common topic that we study in finance is to think about what determines the value of an asset, right? So this often goes by the name, by the way, of asset pricing. So what are assets? So examples would be think about uh, real estate or a piece of art or a financial asset such as stocks and bonds uh, that we are going to see. The question is what determines the price of such an asset, right? Now, the interesting thing is that the markets for assets are somewhat fundamentally different from markets for other goods, right? So imagine that, uh, you just have bought a uh, fruit to consume or you have got some vegetables to kind of like use at home. Typically, the objective is to just figure out, you know, how much uh, benefit are you going to get from that uh, consuming that item, right? However, in markets for assets, not only is the focus on how much benefit that you get from using or consuming that item, but there's also oftentimes a secondary motive that buyers have when they are kind of like thinking about whether to purchase an asset or not, right? So what is this secondary motive? Motive, this is that uh, not only is there some direct benefit from owning the asset, but typically the buyers would also often want to kind of like want to sell it later, right? So for example, going back to our three examples that you had, uh, one purpose of kind of like buying a real estate is that you want to kind of perhaps maybe use the house to stay in. But another objective would be after some point, you might want to kind of like uh, sell it at a, perhaps a higher price, hopefully, right? Similarly, uh, you might kind of like enjoy having an artwork around you, but you might also want to sell it at a later time. Uh, you might want to kind of like enjoy the benefits such as dividends that you get from owning a share, but you might want to sell it uh, at some point in the future as well, right? So that second motive is actually going to be an important factor in determining what is the value of the asset, right? So uh, what we get from that is that people basically buy assets for two reasons, right? So one is that there is some benefit from owning it, right? So we need to think of a way of quantifying uh, that benefit in a in a term that which we can actually use to uh, kind of like think about what's the value of the asset. But secondly, there is a uh, kind of like a consideration that you want to be able to sell it later uh, to get some monetary gains also, right? So one common element from both of these elements is that this involves an aspect of the future, right? So it's not just perhaps current benefit from owning it. So suppose you purchased a flat, uh, it's not only that you kind of get to stay in it from now, but you would probably want to stay in it in uh, the next few years, right? Uh, so how much benefit do you expect uh, from owning it directly, right? Uh, in the next few years, you have to take that into account uh, and you have to think about what are your needs going to be, right? And if you want to be able to sell it later, then again, there's an aspect of, you know, how much exactly are you going to be able to sell it later for, right? What is the uh, price that you can get, right? So you have the element of future here. And because the future is so uncertain, then you have to deal with about how this uncertainty kind of like plays in into thinking about how to value this different assets, right? So this will be one important consideration. So to summarize what we have said so far is that uh, the value of a financial asset, which by the way is often known as a security, uh, depends on at least a couple of things. So this is the size of the cash flows that it is expected to generate, as well as the uncertainty in one's forecast of this cash flows, right? So here also, the notice the use of the word cash flows. Uh, what we want to say is that the cash flows is basically a way of monetizing the benefits that you are kind of going to get, right? So we want to kind of like think of the benefits that you might be getting, the different, uh, you know, that, you know, you may have some locational advantage and everything. So if you are kind of like owning a flat and staying in it, probably you are not getting paid monetarily directly, right? But we would think of a way of attaching a monetary value of the benefits that you are enjoying from flat, right? So that would be, again, an aspect that will get into the valuation, right? So let's take a couple of examples of financial assets and look at a few more features, okay? Again, don't worry if this is going too fast. As I said, the whole purpose 
of the course is to kind of like make sure that you understand these things in great detail and that is kind of like coming up in the next few weeks right so one particular financial asset that will be our focus for uh quite some time is what is known as a bond right so what is a bond so this is basically a security that promises to pay a fixed amount of money at specific intervals okay so this is probably one of the most simplest type of financial securities that you have. And bonds are typically issued by uh, different governments, different corporations, different firms, and so on, right? Uh, so interestingly, you know, just because a security promises to pay a fixed amount of money does not mean that it will be able to kind of like uh, go ahead and keep that promise, right? So in fact, you know, this is exactly what it means when we say that bonds default. So what me it means is that they were unable to kind of like stick to the payment schedule that they had promised, right? Uh, so typically you will see that uh, the risk of the default is different for government bonds as well as uh, corporate bonds. Even among different types of governments, uh, the risk is higher in some cases, the risk is lower in some other bonds, right? Uh, and we'll think about how do how do people measure those uh, risks and also how are these risks priced. But let, let's first focus on the simplest possible case where suppose that the bond is issued by governments where the risk of default is considered very negligible, right? So think about maybe the uh, Switzerland government kind of like issuing bonds just as an example to start off with, right? So, so what are the sort of like uh, kind of like studies that people do on this? So for example, one interesting finding uh, is that when the stream of payments from an asset is fixed, which is the case uh, as we have for a bond where the risk of default is very negligible, then the price of the asset will be inversely related, which means negatively related to the interest rate it yields, right? Uh, again, we'll discuss in more details what does it mean about interest rate yields and so on, but let's just kind of like take this at uh, face value for now. So suppose the bond in consideration is a one-year bond, which means that this is going to make uh, the final payment in one year's time. And suppose that it is promising to pay 10,000 rupees a year from now. Okay, so this is the only single payment that this bond is promising to make. Okay, and that's it. Once that payment is made, then the uh, then it's kind of like term is over. Okay, so what should be the price of the bond uh, today? So suppose the price is actually P rupees, right? Uh, so what it means is that if one were to buy the bond today at a cost of P rupees and hold it for a year to get 10,000 rupees a year from now, then we are going to say that the rate of return from holding this bond is going to be given by 10,000 minus P by P, right? So remember, P is the cost of buying the bond today. 10,000 is the amount of money that this bond is going to pay out in one year's time, right? So this is the rate of return from holding this bond, okay? So we are also going to say equivalently that the interest rate on the bond is given by exactly this rate of return, right? This 10,000 minus P by P that you have, right? So just to fix some numbers, suppose P was 9,000 rupees, then the interest rate on this bond would have been 10,000 minus 9,000 by 9,000, or which is around 11.1% per year, right? Now, interestingly, this is the interest rate on this bond, but typically investors have different opportunities to kind of invest in different things, right? Uh, so there may be a uh, opportunity to kind of like uh, invest in other bonds, right? Issued by different corporations, uh, uh, kind of like other stocks and so on, right? And so typically you would expect that the investors would be comparing the rate of return that this particular bond is going to give with the rate of return that is going to come from other assets, right? Uh, now, here one thing to be careful of is that these other assets, when we are comparing, we need to compare similar assets, right? And again, that will be one aspect where we'll be spending a lot of time on is to figure out how do we kind of like think about assets uh, and how do we compare different assets, right? Because assets have different characteristics. So one of them is, of course, the rate of return, but then you have the characteristics such as risk uh, and so on, right? And you have got assets which may be paying out over not just one year, but many years, right? So then how do you compare those different assets? So that will be, again, one consideration for us, right? But even from our very basic kind of like study of this uh, instrument so far, so suppose that we have figured out that there are some assets which are very similar to this bond, and they have also offering some interest rates, right? So one very kind of like uh, obvious finding hopefully by this point is that if you have got that this other interest rates in the economy are rising, then the interest rate on the bonds will have to rise too, right? Why is that the case? Because 
if uh, that is not the case, then kind of like you will not be actually wanting to hold on to these bonds in this first place, right? You will want to hold on the other assets, right? So then you must expect that these interest rates will be kind of like rising at the same time. And here we can see that uh, interest rates rising is the same thing as saying that the price of the bonds must fall, right? Otherwise, these uh, bonds are no longer that attractive so that's that's already something interesting okay so so far we have been discussing about government bonds which have a uh, negligible risk of default so there will also be kind of like discussion about uh, bonds which can kind of like default so corporate bonds are a classic example of things which are not risk free again it depends on which firms issue the bonds but typically corporate bonds are considered more riskier than government bonds right so then the question will be how do you price in this risk right so again at a very uh, basic level what you would expect is the following that if you have a high risk of default then that would translate into high interest rates demanded by investors and therefore it would translate into a lower bond price compared to bonds which are uh, less risky right so the greater the risk of default then the higher will be the interest rate that the investors demand in order to hold this asset and that means that if you have got two bonds which promise exactly the same stream of payments then the riskier one will have a lower price right so this is one insight that you get about what would be the effect of risk right so investors therefore will earn a higher interest rate if they buy the riskier bond and it happens not to default right because you don't know beforehand whether it's going to default or not so you get a uh, higher interest rate compared to a uh, less risky asset only if default does not happen but of course you do get a higher risk that you know the payments that this bond has been saying uh they may actually not materialize as well right so you have kind of like you know you have to go to this trade-off and then think about what are the implications of that for the pricing of bonds right so this is again we are still in the realm of this asset pricing that we have been discussing okay so another type of uh, assets which you may have heard of a lot is what is known as stocks or shares, right? So these are basically a claim on part of assets of a firm. So if you're thinking of stocks issued by firm and therefore uh, one of the most important assets of a firm is its profits, right? Now, basically uh, profits of a firm belong to its shareholders in direct proportion to the share that each right and whenever firms generate profit they are going to be like a, a division into two parts so one part goes off into paying dividends to the shareholders and the second part is kind of retained in the firm so as to kind of maybe make some more investments so as to increase the future profitability of the firms right so one difference between stocks and bonds is that as compared to bonds which pre-specify the payment schedule stocks typically do not offer any uh, promised stream of payments right so yes you know that uh, you are going to get dividends at some point maybe uh, but it's not announced beforehand right so you have to kind of form some expectations about the dividends that you expect to get so therefore that's one aspect that is different and of course you have then the kind of like a major part of the valuation of the stocks is not just uh, dividends but is also about perhaps uh, the gains that you can make if you hold on to it for some time and then you are able to sell it for a higher price compared to what you had purchased it for right so again when we are thinking about how to value stocks these are the aspects that we will be focusing on right but you can also expect that uh, uh, if firms are expected to generate greater net earnings that should have lead to a higher valuation of the firms and therefore that should also lead to a higher share price so these are again some things that we will look into in more details uh, when we are thinking about how to value shares as an example of a asset pricing problem right okay uh, so one aspect that is kind of like uh, common between bonds and stocks are the uncertainty over its earnings right so uh, remember that uh, when we talked about bonds we said that uh, there is maybe some default risk so that's the future of uncertainty right and stocks of course you know there is uncertainty about uh, when or uh, if the dividends are going to be paid out how much dividends are going to be paid out and there's also uncertainty about how much can you sell a stock for in the future right so clearly this uncertainty and risk is an important aspect of the evaluation 
And uh, then again, people have thought about different ways of classifying risk. So you have got something which is called systematic risk. So these would correspond to events that uh, simultaneously affect different classes of financial assets at the same time, right? So what would be examples of systematic risk? Uh, this would be changes in trade policy affecting the export sector of the country. This would be changes in interest rate, which affects uh, different um, sectors in the country so, so for example whenever you have the uh central bank kind of like announcing policy rates there is a lot of kind of attention to it from different uh entities right so because it affects house prices it affects uh also the uh prospects of the different uh companies which are selling maybe different products and so on right we'll see the reason later on by the way why that is the case uh or you might have got like kind of like information coming in about the economies uh kind of like condition about what is the kind of like the household sentiment about purchasing as well as saving right so all of these are kind of things that not only just affect one individual firm or a particular sector but affect wide variety of different sectors right and we'll see that this is actually a risk which is undiversifiable, right? So these are terms that we are going to kind of explore in more details when we are going to be thinking about the problem, which is known as portfolio optimization, right? So how do you construct a portfolio, taking into account different risks that are there of the different assets and which assets should you hold in your portfolio given your risk appetite? and your preferences, right? So this is the portfolio optimization problem. And we'll kind of uh, investigate these aspects much more systematic risk. And what does it mean? So we'll see that uh, this kind of systematic risk that we have been talking about, these are actually things which cannot be diversified away that easily, right? So in fact, you can think of them as undiversifiable. As opposed to systematic risk, you may have idiosyncratic risks, which are basically risks that affect only a given firm or an asset. And these are actually kind of like diversifiable, right? So what would be an example? So from a company's perspective, suppose a company kind of like uh, is in the, has spent a lot of R&D on a product, whether the product develops successfully or not is a matter that is of great importance to this particular company, uh, but may not be of general interest to the whole economy right? Or if the company is engaged in a litigation or a lawsuit, then the outcome of the lawsuit is perhaps of in interest to that company or perhaps to that sector, but not necessarily again to the whole economy, right? So these are sort of the risks that are going to be relevant for this particular firm or asset, but these are basically risks that you can actually diversify away. And we'll also see when we study the portfolio optimization problem, that these are sort of the risks which are irrelevant from a valuation perspective, right? So because uh, this systematic risk cannot be diversified away, then we need to think into account about how does this systematic risk actually affect our um, kind of like valuation of the assets. And so therefore, whenever investors are thinking about different uh, kind of companies that they want to invest in, they'll also be paying attention to what is the level of systematic risk that this company is exposed to, right? So although you have like the systematic risk affecting a lot of different companies, assets and sectors, you will have different exposures from different companies, sectors and so on, right? So any company which is uh, kind of like associated with high levels of systematic risk, then kind of then the earnings will be much more volatile in a way that cannot be easily diversified away by building a portfolio, right? So that would mean that the rate of return that is required in order to convince investors to buy shares in this company has to be kind of like uh, comparatively higher, right? And this rate of return, by the way, that that is required to induce the investors to buy is something which is called the required rate of return or the market capitalization rate. So we'll again kind of see what are the factors that determines the market capitalization rate of a particular firm or sector and see how we can think of a way of kind of uh, thinking about how much exposure does this kind of company or sector have to the systematic risk, right? So these are again things that are an important part of the valuation and we'll study aspects of these when we kind of look into things such as portfolio optimization and later on kind of like uh, capital asset pricing models, right? So again, just to kind of summarize for now, what you would expect is that for any given beliefs about expected uh, future earnings, the share value is going to be uh, uh, going to be higher for companies with a lower market capitalization rate.